Good morning, um, um, ladies and gentlemen. So um, it's a pleasure for us to uh, start with this um, uh, online uh, session. Um, uh, smart soils, um, a smart specialization meets EU soil mission. So my name is Cristina Gallardo and I'm part of the um, uh, of Extremadura in Spain. Uh, so we are um, a private under the Public Law Foundation that participate at partners in uh, nations um, EU projects. So we are um, a, a project uh, within, uh, we are a, C a CSA within the mission soil. And, and in this uh, um, framework, we are organizing this uh, debate uh, that is uh, uh, intending to um, uh, make closer the uh, small specialization strategies at regional le levels in Europe and the EU uh, soil deal for a uh, soil health um, mission uh, in the framework of um, uh, Horizon Europe and and the rest of the initiatives in the European Commission. So um, just to start um, uh, with a short uh, remark. So the meeting is is uh, being recorded because it's going to be uploaded to um, YouTube uh, and website uh, nations or project um, tools. So the way to interact uh, uh, during the whole um, uh, presentations will be uh, through uh, the chat of uh, this Zoom um, um, tool. Uh, so you can directly write. We are going to be um, aware of what you are, are writing. But for the uh, two rounds that we will have in question and answers, you will be able just to raise your hand and open your micro when you um, uh, when we let you speak, because we will have um, uh, time for uh, intervention from the audience. Uh, we don't have uh, much time for many interventions, but uh, raising your hands, we will uh, try to manage with the with the direct intervention. But all, all the interventions, please, through the chat, are uh, welcome, and uh, we can uh, just send uh, these comments to the uh, speakers, and uh, everybody in the uh, meeting can uh, see what you are uh, um, going to share with the rest of the participants in the in the event. So why why we are here? What are the objectives of our um, uh, um, webinar this uh, this morning? So uh, it's uh, uh, we are very as we are focused um, in uh, missions from uh, three uh, two years until uh, now. Uh, we think that we need to it's needed to spread uh, the uh, the topic and the and the uh, and and the uh, place where we discuss on how to solve and transform um, uh, soils in, in Europe. So uh, the stimulation at local and regional uh, level and how useful are the small specialization strategies as uh, um, uh, tools for fostering innovation? We thought that will be uh, good to uh, discuss on new uh, and alternative channels for uh, achieving um, transformative uh, processes. So we, if we are able, we are going to put a small seed for new initiative and project, uh, both at regional and local level about soil health challenges. So um, how we are going to do this? So we have this agenda that you can see, uh, two hours of, of time with two uh, blocks to part of uh, uh, interventions in this, uh, because we want to have from the more abroad perspective from the uh, uh, up to the uh, bottom uh, side. Uh, in the first part, you will have presentations um, um, uh, on a uh, mission-oriented innovation policy. Uh, then we will have the interventions uh, both from uh, DG Agriculture and Rural Development in the European Commission, uh, uh, where we are going to be more focused on, on soil mission. And other presentations from the S3 uh, community of practice uh, to see uh, how uh, smart specialization strategies can impact on the missions. So um, uh, this 
initial part uh, with question and answers, and then a second part with with, with practices um, uh, at regional level. So uh, the um, uh, mission is uh, uh, focused in uh, in three areas. Uh, three three of the areas of uh, uh, um, nations project is focused on three uh, areas: uh, soil in for agriculture, soil in forestry, and soil in urban and post-industrial uh, soil. So we uh, selected three. Um, uh, uh, regions uh, that has to make the diagnosis of specialization through these three areas, and I want to listen from them how, if they are or if they feel um, near or uh, very um, uh, far from uh, soil health, and I want just to let uh, them know how they can think on uh, make closer um, uh, their uh, uh, specialization and the uh, soil health uh, challenge. Uh, we will follow with these question and answers and some conclusions at the end of the um, event. So uh, we are here um, until yesterday. We were uh, 157 uh, people uh, registered. Uh, the people that we are here today and are registered are uh, from uh, 28 different countries, uh, some participants even outside the uh, uh, European Union um, member states or associated countries to Horizon Europe. And we have five coordinators uh, looking for partners. So all the people that are here, we are here because we are working on uh, from a regional perspective or we are interested on 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 mission and uh, we are expert in, in missions so the way we have the thing that will be useful for um, those that we are here to interact between it each other so we have uh, this is an online format and we have two hours of interview how to contextualize this relationship but we are here and we have been uh, recognized it how ourselves uh, from uh, uh, being classified uh, uh, if we are uh, in projects of uh, soil if we are from the academia we are come came from the government uh, we can came from owners or associations and uh, some people that are um, promoting themselves uh, as coordinator of, of uh, following proposal for the living lab um, soil. So um, uh, we have prepared, you, you can see on the chat, uh, we have prepared this uh, a mirror board where we can see uh, who are involved. The objective of saying this is that we can directly um, put in contact and uh, and realize and uh, 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 in the meantime that we follow the presentations, we can discover who are uh, with us and are interested as we are. And the objective is to find uh, participants and in the meeting network with them. So there are all other alternatives for networking that we will refer to them at the end of the, of the event. But for during the event, we can uh, just interact uh, with the, through this link that you can find in the chat. Uh, um, debate and dialogue between in a regional perspective and a, a mission um, oriented is a nation uh, project. We are, uh, you can see here the group of partners that we are working on 2023 and 2024, promoting and pro uh, creating materials and uh, for raising awareness on um, at regional and national uh, level uh, uh, about how living labs can help to um, solve um, uh, uh, soil uh, challenges and to foster matchmaking and cross-regional um, clustering uh, for uh, proposals in uh, mission soil and for the, the additional debate on soil uh, challenges. So we are doing through many, many tools that you can see in our nation's um, uh, website. I don't going to be uh, so much on the different tools that you can see. There are much making activities we have faxed it on uh, with a specific uh, contents on uh, uh, health in uh, the different usage of soils uh, we have uh, frequent and asking asking questions a permanent health dex uh, we have coatings with a list of co coordinates of the countries we organize webinar and thematic events at this one that we are here and we have amas making and transnational tool for creating the um 
Uh, sorry, I think we have some technical uh, issue. Uh, Christina just uh, got frozen. I'm here again. Okay, yes. Yes, okay, so I'm going just to continue. Um, a nation's uh, framework, and that's all sort of from my side, okay? So then I uh, now I go with this um, uh, framework, who we are, why we are here, what is the debate. I'm going just to pass the floor in this uh, part one, contextualization of smart soils. We we uh, make this um, game with the names, <laughs> smart specialization and smart soils. And I'm going to pass uh, the floor to uh, the first intervention. All right. I'm going to leave uh, to share. So, uh, Professor Hansen, uh, please, could you like to share your screen? Yeah, it's coming up. I guess this works. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, allowing me to be part of this. Um, I am a researcher uh, focusing on innovation policy for societal challenges. So, I don't know an awful lot about soil health, but I do know about the other two main topics of this morning which I will focus on in this first talk uh, on the conceptual part of different innovation policy approaches. So mission-oriented innovation policy is what I will first describe. Moving on to smart specialization, um, seems maybe obvious what they are, but we will find that both of them, there are kind of different interpretations of what they could be. And then I try to merge this in, in coming up with some arguments on what approaches for regional missions uh, could look like if you take a smart specialization uh, perspective. And then finally, if time permits, I'll also place this in the perspective of particularly the EU soil health mission, uh, but indeed only if I do have time, I think we're a bit behind schedule. And also uh, the subsequent uh, presentations will also be, of course, on the soil health mission in particular. So let me go right to the mission-oriented innovation policy concept, which most of you, as I understood, might have heard about, uh, and which seems um, pretty straightforward. Uh, also, if you read the word by uh, Mariana Mazzucato, which would consist of the argument that, you know, if we really want to drive change, we need to do more than just R&D in all sorts of directions, but we need to focus on societal goals, ambitious, measurable, time-bound societal goals, like huh, having a certain quantity of uh, soils in Europe healthy by a certain year. Um, and that will be then the mission. So that seems obvious, but the question would then be, how do we go about and from my interactions with policymakers at national and regional levels or innovation agencies, I find that there's, there's rather distinct interpretations on what mission-oriented innovation policy would be, um, even why you would engage with it, but also how you then organize it, what kind of instruments you use, what kind of governance systems. And I usually explain this by using this framework, which perhaps seems a little bit complex, but I'll take you through it. Um, on the horizontal axis, we see, uh, we see, well, the figure depicts different ways to think about innovation policy. And that can be really uh, a push of technology that's on the left-hand side or demand pool. So in response to societal challenges we want to solve. And on the vertical axis, we see uh, on the lower part that it could all be about knowledge creation, uh, whereas the upper part is really the diffusion of innovation and solutions. So then there's different very archetypical ways of innovation policies that you see here, R&D policy on the lower left, so that is just new research uh, in, in any sort of topic. Then the challenge-led R&D policy, uh, focusing R&D policies on particular societal topics. That's the right bottom part, so more demand pool. Uh, and the left upper side uh, would not just be just R&D policy, but really focusing on what are the infrastructures, the the human capital, the legislation we need to diffuse new solutions, for instance, for soil health management. And the right upper side is, is more the, the more modern or current way of thinking about innovation policy, which we call transformative, which is not so much about R&D, but it is really about different stakeholders experimenting with different type of novelty, integrating that, seeing what works in terms of business models, in terms of the local interest, um, and much more experimental rather than that. Uh, based on innovation coming from laboratories. So where does mission-oriented innovation policy sit? Well, in the middle, we could say, but actually in all of these corners. So for some innovation agencies or, or policymakers, mission-oriented policy is research policy, like challenge-led R&D policy. It's just, again, uh, funding R&D projects and programs, but then focused on particular societal topics. 
but you also have mission-oriented industrial policy, which really focuses on the businesses side. What can we do to accommodate businesses that want to uh, deploy new innovations? Well, maybe they need subsidies uh, or legislation or other kind of, of uh, support. And it can also be very transformative, which is what you do when you, as I say, bring citizens, municipalities, um, uh, firms, universities together to discover how their different types of knowledge can be combined in, in working out solutions that fit a particular context. Um, and actually, it is uh, sometimes harmful that there are such different ways of thinking about what mission-oriented innovation policy is. At the same time, it can also be a little bit of a strength that it's so ambiguous because it allows uh, different type of policymakers to to work on missions, so to work on this on the same societal challenges, but from very different logics. So that's what we see happening. That at the European Commission level, there's frameworks, but then countries uh, also uh, have national frameworks and science foundations actually work on the same missions, uh, and then regions or investment boards also um, mobilize all their efforts for the same missions, and maybe they have a different interpretation in mind of what 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 the policy is, but they all contribute to the same goal. So in that sense, the ambiguity here can also have a positive element. So another important distinction is that there's different type of missions, which can be accelerating the type of innovations we have or really uh, transforming what we produce and what we consume. Missions can be primarily economically oriented or societally. But the one I want to highlight is that there can be uh, what I call directionality based or directionality searching. So based would be that we already have a perfect understanding of what the problem is and how we're going to solve it. So that would be the moonshot mission where the objective is clear and we also have a sense of what gets us there. But actually, and, and that fits a lot with how many people I think have an understanding of what missions are. There is a plan and now we all work according to that plan. Actually, if you look at reality on how most current examples of mission oriented policy look, I find them more directionality searching. So a mission uh, goal has been launched, but now it's really up to different actors uh, from governments, markets, and society to, to interpret what the problem really is and what solutions might be viable and which ones can be combined. Um, and then the mission is creating a space for discovery and negotiation, also discovering how this matches all kind of interest from different societal stakeholders and businesses. So much more open-ended. So that is part one. Well, just briefly on smart specialization. Also there, there's a bit of a variety on what you would think smart specialization is. There's a very narrow understanding, which is every region prioritizes a few number of industries or topics, and that's what they focus their R&D on. The broader understanding or how it was originally conceived would be that it's all about enabling actors in the region to find how they, which different strengths they have, which local assets, and how these can be combined in different ways so that they discover what the diversification paths are. So where they could innovate together, given uh, the skills and knowledge they have, and uh, maybe had uh, the different uh, weather conditions or land, all of these ingredients. So very experimental, which is not top-down saying, this is the, the, uh, the technology or industry we pick, but enabling that uh, stakeholders together uh, look for opportunities. And that could be based on adopting key enabling technologies, so very advanced technologies, but it always has to do actually smart specialization with building the capacity to uh, together explore new opportunities. So if we then bring together missions and smart specialization, well, in both cases, you could take a very narrow understanding. Smart regional missions would be in a narrow understanding, um, focusing your R&D funding and efforts on societal topics, which I do see in a couple of regions. They say we have smart regions, but then it's, well, they pick a few topics and then it's quite classical uh, innovation subsidies. But the broader understanding would be that missions are a vehicle or an approach or a process for discovering um, what um, different uh, opportunities are there for our regions and how can we develop uh, um, um, governance uh, structures, for instance, have platforms or roadmaps in which different stakeholders articulate which opportunities they see and we see what can we combine to build synergies. So that, inquire, that re, uh, requires very different types of governance. It's, it's not just dictating anything, but it's, it's uh, building networks that, uh, that allow different stakeholders to discover uh, unexploited opportunities, uh, combining their, their knowledge and assets. And this, allow, this fits very well in the living lab notion, which is central to the EU health, uh, soil health mission, 
which allows for this experimentation and doesn't dictate much who is involving it or what they do. It's a rather flexible concept. So what would be main arguments to or, or approaches to do this? Well, one point is to, to not wait for European or national governments to, to kind of pick solutions and then invest in, in, in those solutions. Uh, because it's very hard, we see that countries select which innovations are we going to work on, because there's probably different technologies uh, that are competing, or there's actually different perspectives on, on where we should go. Um, and at the regional level, well, there's fewer capabilities and assets, there's less contestation, so and actors are more closely situated. So it's, it's, it's a simpler puzzle, there's less pieces that should be fit together. Because, um, well, there, there's fewer candidates, fewer technologies that, that might be contesting for um, being invested in to solve the mission. And also local governments can create lead markets. So they have usually resources to really advance a few technologies. And then the second argument is that we tend to overestimate perhaps um, the power of R&D based solutions, whereas we find that actually in the application and integrating phase, where local stakeholders, which could in this case be landowners, land managers, uh, but also municipalities and citizens, um, uh, discover, let's say, new business models. Huh? Why would you, uh, how, uh, when does it pay off to have a more biodiverse approach um, that might have to do with, with uh, other firms situated nearby and discovering how that can be organized is another reason to, to focus really on regional mission. And the final one is what I tend to call cross specialization. And Sometimes in regions, you see they have very different knowledge bases or local strengths that are very different from each other, and they are not combined, these knowledge bases, whereas actually missions are a societal challenge are a very obvious way to say, okay, we, we want to make, um, uh, we want to enhance sustainability or the quality of soil health. How can we then bring together technologies that hardly meet each other? For instance, uh, sensor technology and satellite technology and, and farming technology, uh, sector A and B, uh, in practice, these might hardly meet, but of course, for, for uh, precision farming, you would actually need crossovers between very different disciplines. So that would be the idea of cross-specialization, that you find topics like a societal mission that could combine the local strengths that normally don't work together. Um, so if I have a few minutes more, let me place this in the context of the EU soil health mission, uh, as I was part of the team evaluating it. So soon we will hear more about well, how that mission works, but the ultimate objective there is we want to improve a higher uptake of soil health practices. Um, and that requires widespread access to relevant proven practices, what works for improving soil health. And to get there, um, the logic here is that there is a demand for much more user-driven experimentation because there can be all sorts of solutions for improving soil health, but they are very context specific, both in terms, of course, of physical conditions, but also institutional conditions like the economic setting and the regulation that applies in a certain country or region. Um, so there needs to be experimentation and we need more knowledge for um, finding out which practices fit uh, different soils. So what the European Commission does is uh, um, supporting through Eurasian Europe uh, R&D calls and these living labs, which are open settings which allow for discovering how can local stakeholders uh, collaborate in ways they haven't done before. And then there are some other uh, tracks within the, or some other uh, actions within the EU soil health mission. One important one, which is also about R&D is indicator development, which uh, allows for creating the indicators that would tell us whether uh, new practices work or not. Um, but it is also a basis for implementing the soil health law and the adaption, adaptation of reward schemes, like the Common Agricultural Policy. So this formally doesn't really fit in the Eurasian Europe part of the EU soil health mission, but it um, is, is, is of major importance for creating the or changing the playing field. Uh, why would it be attractive to adopt practices? Well, one of it is, of course, if the soil health law obliges this, the upcoming law, or the other one would be if uh, reward schemes like the Common Agricultural Policy uh, uh, yeah, reward uh, practices that improve the, the health status of soils. And both these uh, legislative changes require indicators. So that's a very particular powerful element I find of this mission, which also demonstrates it's in the end more than just doing R&D. It's about bringing uh, 
in place, putting in place uh, additional um, factors, in this case legislation, that really improve the conditions that make it attractive to, uh, uh, to improve soil health. And that uh, um, well, also relies on the time and capacity of, of what the mission secretariat uh, at the EU level does. And also projects like these, the nation's projects and events like these, to also promote um, the attention for, uh, for soil health. In the end, that also contributes to the, uh, the, uh, the adaptation of, of legislation. So two major findings from that review were that uh, actually uh, nowadays many missions tend to be rather R&D based, whereas they want to have impacts that go beyond producing knowledge. Well, the EU soil health mission actually is a good example of a mission that, that seems to be more transformative because it, it doesn't do just doesn't just allow for experimentation but by also investing in these indicators and engaging policymakers, it might more, in a more holistic sense, improve the conditions uh, for experimenting with new solutions. And a downside would be found not just for this mission, but for other missions, is that there's problems with uh, engaging national and regional stakeholders. For them, it's rather invisible, or sometimes they're not aware how they can contribute to this mission or what is expected from them. So that would be another reason, again, to be rather proactive and start thinking how can these missions uh, we, we shouldn't be waiting for a strategy or uh, someone to tell us which innovations we should invest in uh, actually there's much more opportunity to to take this mandate of experimenting and uh, using the, the the openness of the mission and, and discovering solutions that fit the local context so in conclusion for this first part of the session so very conceptual there's different ways actually to think about missions, although the main ingredients seem clear. Why to consider it, how to deploy it, and how to do it might differ very much according to your interpretation. In all cases, mission-oriented policy is very place-specific um, because it also builds on well uh, the regulations and conditions you already locally have and the stakeholder, where they want to go, which technologies are interesting for them, so the capacities they possess. That's what you want to leverage. Um, to address local or global problems. And I would say particularly yeah, the, the ones that are local, locally most articulated. And then finally, um, because there's different views on what missions can be, well, sometimes you see that this is ambiguity that can paralyze, uh, especially policymakers, they can get in this waiting mood, but also businesses and universities, they can say, as long as we don't know really what the plan is, we're not gonna take action which is of course detrimental because the whole point of missions is to take an urgent problem and start working on that. So we shouldn't be waiting for clarity. Uh, therefore I would claim uh, be proactive. If there's no leadership coming from elsewhere, the, the, the imperative would be to start these local discovery processes. And actually a good example of that, which we will hear more about I think today is the collective platform from Extremadura, which is one of those initiatives which says, okay, well, there's a few central topics that seem of societal importance. Nobody is going to say top down how we're going to solve this problem. Uh, we just acknowledge it's important and different stakeholders might contribute to it, but we need to discover to what extent they agree and then what would they need in terms of funding or regulation. So that's a bit of a dynamic uh, process rather than executing a plan as originally seen in the, in the Moonshot mission, which was more technological and uh, less contested. So this would be my introductory talk on on different ways of, of thinking about uh, missions and smart specialization. And I look forward for the, the additional well, talk you. and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin, for, for um, uh, this inspiring um, um, introduction. On how, now we are all mission-oriented. <laughs> And, uh, and now we are going to continue how missions are implemented uh, in the European Commission's um, uh, through uh, mission soil. And now this is the time for me to ask um, Luis, uh, um, uh, from, um, uh, Luis Sanchez Alvarez, uh, from the European Commission, um, the um, DG for Agriculture and Rural uh, Development, who is going to introduce soil mission and the linkage with the smart specialization strategy. So, um, uh, Luis, um, could, can you open just yeah. directly your micro? Thank you, Luis. Thank you so much. Go yeah. ahead. Thank you, Christina. I think you can see my screen. 
Yes, we can. Yeah. We can see. Okay. Thank you very much. So I will continue taking exactly where Mateis uh, left the point. I think he gave a very good introduction to my presentation and advanced a uh, number of concepts that I will skip <laughs> for obvious reasons. He made it very clear what the missions are about and so on. So jumping directly into the soil mission, uh, I don't think it this slide needs a lot of explanation, but I think it's important because one of my points will be that soils in particular and healthy soils uh, have a, a strong territorial dimension. And this is because apart from producing and using land uh, in an intensive way, 95% of our food comes from directly from soil, uh, soils also provide other services such as uh, regulation of water and purification, which is becoming more and more important with the uh, impact of the climate change. It also have a role on uh, cycling nutrients and carbon, hosting biodiversity, and beyond that, support human activities. So soils are an intrinsic part of the Green Deal and um, important component to really achieve climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, the reality is that our soils are uh, today uh, unhealthy in a 60% estimated uh, proportion for different reasons, for contamination, losing carbon, uh, in other places, uh, excess of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus that provocate eutrophication, erosion, desertification. At the end, it can be summarized in one number, an estimation of 50 billion per year associated to soil degradation in the Union. So uh, the policy approach from the Union, the big umbrella is the Green Deal that was uh, adopted in uh, 2019. And the, the soil has been then uh, triggered by different strategies and action plans. The first one was the EU biodiversity strategy in 2020, and then the EU soil strategy in 21, and also mentioned before the proposal for a directive on soil monitoring and resilience last July. So this will be the first uh, EU law that will protect the soil as it was the situation, or it is the situation for other natural resources such as water or air, for example. So uh, there is a construction around this uh, where Europe uh, plans to tackle uh, this uh, uh, point on have healthier soils and innovation had an important role. And this is also one of the connections with the smart specialization. There are three components. One is the policy one. I already mentioned that. The other one is the um, uh, knowledge have. So how we measure, how we uh, collect information, how we really are able to assess the impact of policies. And finally, the mission that is uh, uh, addressing a number of challenges. One is the knowledge practice divide. So on the one hand, uh, there is a lot of research and knowledge on soils, but uh, not managers are not aware of all of this knowledge or they have problems to use this knowledge. So this is one of the things that in general missions, but the mission soil uh, address in a, a especially uh, realistic way. There are also some uh, uh, knowledge gaps uh, when it comes to emerging fields of or areas of concern, such as biodiversity, contamination, carbon farming, waste management, and finally, uh, soil monitoring. So in only a few countries in Europe uh, have monitoring plans and protocols and are not harmonized. So the mission try to address all these challenges in a transdisciplinary way, but using these uh, living labs mainly, not only, but mainly as a real life testing sites. Uh, so in practice, there are uh, one goal, one uh, visible, tangible one, uh, goal, which is to create these 100 living labs. But there are many uh, uh, specific objectives that uh, match with the issues and challenges I uh, presented before, so uh, such as the certification, uh, carbon stocks, um, soil sealing, and land take, pollution, etc. And also the EU global footprint on soils, and improving soil literacy. So 
there is another point that also has very much to do with regional dimension, which is the engagement with the local communities to find solutions adapted to their conditions. So these are the living labs about, so real life sites where people meet to co-design, test and monitor solutions that are expected to be uh, adopted in, an, uh, in a faster way uh, in the future. So, um, uh, the mission strategy is uh, built around these uh, four blocks. I will not enter into the details. I already mentioned, I think, in one way or another, most of them, all of them. A bit more of detail on the living labs. Uh, these 100 living labs uh, will uh, involve uh, 1,000 test testing sites across Europe, so trained to cover all uh, pedoclimatic conditions, but not only physical, chemical uh, conditions. It's also about uh, cultural, economic, social dimensions to empower a rapid transition and the uptake of solutions, as was very well explained in the previous presentation. So it's much driven by the end user needs and, uh, and, and these living labs uh, cover, and that's important, I didn't mention yet, not only because I work for DG Agriculture and Rural Development, but I'm here representing the mission secretariat and the mission is uh, about all types of soils and land uses. So it's not only agricultural soil, it's also industrial, urban, natural forest soils. When a determined site reveals uh, as a successful approach to a given uh, issue or challenge, it can become a lighthouse, which uh, in practice means that goes beyond co-design and much more on demonstration, training and communication for advisors and in general for landowners and for awareness of the general society. So where we are with the mission today, uh, after three years, we have already deployed uh, more than 300 million and we have around uh, 50 projects. 28 are ongoing from the first two calls, 21, 22, and uh, another around 20 have been now selected and uh, will start uh, mid this year, more or less. But the mission will continue until the end of the framework program and many more projects will, uh, will come to cover all these different aspects, objectives that I already mentioned, and of course, to deploy uh, the network of living labs. So uh, coming now a little bit uh, uh, to the point of the connection with the smart specialization, soil health is a territorial issue. So with these maps that come uh, from our dashboard that is uh, available uh, in, on the website, you can see that uh, the different issues are uh, well uh, spread over the territory of the Union when it comes to uh, water erosion or uh, problems in organic content, uh, biological functions or soil sealing. And this is just a, a, a sample because there are 17 indicators when you can also check uh, that most of these indicators are really very much distributed uh, all over uh, the territory of the Union. Uh, we are trying since the very beginning engaging with the regional, local and municipalities, uh, local authorities and municipalities. Indeed, is uh, challenging. Uh, one of the ways we are trying to create this big community is uh, by signing our manifesto, which is a document of to adhere to the objectives of the mission. We have already around 20 signatories, uh, regions and local authorities, but we are making efforts to try to involve more and more uh, regions because uh, uh, the territorial dimension or regions are really at the forefront of local soil management. So they are in touch with land managers. They have a great responsibilities on special planning, for example, on regulation, on community building. So for us, they are pivotal to deploying the mission objectives. Uh, it's not uh, by coincidence that one of the cross-cutting dimensions of the mission, together with international business and digital, is the territorial dimension. And the smart specialization is already was already mentioned and addressed in the mission implementation plan that was launched before the mission started. 
uh, I have been, uh, I, I have to say, uh, in any case, that uh, uh, we uh, really need to uh, explore and uh, progress more in this uh, connection with the smart specialization. I would, was making um, a, a bit of uh, investigation uh, to see uh, to update information because we have uh, information in our mission implementation plan but updated information for this new programming period and there are as you can see on the right hand side of the slide that there are many strategies already in Europe that specifically address protection of soil, general planning of land use or agriculture and forestry and fisheries, which are uh, a big part of the uh, land area in Europe. So the mission has the advantage of being a dynamic instrument that is continually interacting with the society and trying to find solutions. And regions, one of the things could uh, identify and are identifying, but maybe more priorities in their strategies related to soil health and develop synergies with the mission. On the other hand, the budget of the mission is completely insufficient to really address the big challenge we have in front of us. So we are our train, and that was also mentioned in the communication on missions that was issued in July last year, uh, mobilize more money, private and also public, from the union, but uh, programmed by other authorities to really uh, uh, address and achieve what we want to achieve here. This is, a, I, I will go very fast, one of these regions, uh, one example of a region that in is a strategy has included a specific mention to soil health, to water cycles, and has initiatives trying again to put together communities, universities, companies to produce solutions very much in the line of what we are doing also we want to do with the, with the Living Labs, for example. So possible tools and activities, of course, linking with emission projects. We will have these 100 uh, living labs in across Europe. So uh, uh, our expectation is that it will really cover most of the more relevant major conditions, cropping systems, uh, industries, uh, post-industrial uh, soils, etc. So there are a lot of resources that can really be interconnected with these strategies. Uh, on the side of the common agricultural policy, we have these operational groups and we expect again that for this uh, until 27, there will be more than 1000 groups working on soil quality. So there is a lot of knowledge and testing and uh, collaboration uh, around soil and also networking activities or even regional innovation values, which is another initiative under Pillar 3 where uh, uh, colleagues are trying to uh, uh, foster European innovation ecosystems, connecting regional innovation valleys, and why not could be uh, one of these valleys on soil health, for example. So we really uh, uh, promote uh, collaboration across boundaries, across uh, borders. Quickly, uh, two or three projects that uh, uh, are offering tools already for, for this, for example, I, the most relevant one is Humus, uh, Healthy Municipal Soils, is developing territorial agreements with the intention of co-designing strategies and actions to improve protection and restoration of soil health to be replicated in other territories. Uh, uh, one of the activities of these projects uh, is to support municipalities and regions and also to work in coherence with RIS-3 and even with uh, RIS-4. Uh, so it's a project that is specifically addressing this collaboration. PrepSol, for example, has identified needs in 21 EU regions, agricultural, but not only, you can see on the right-hand side, forestry, mix, urban and post-industrial. So you can see there drivers, solutions, potential solutions. Uh, so this is another project that is a good tool to uh, incorporate or to consider. Benchmarks, for example, is working rather on uh, indicators, but the approach is also to engage with uh, stakeholders for testing and validating indicators in different regions using as well living labs. So you can see also this approach coming from the local assets, from the local values and, and, and strengthens to the EU level. 
And finally, there will be a new topic on spatial planning. So this is a strategy for us because uh, we are well aware that soil functions are not part of the spatial planning uh, approach in general. So here uh, we want to really analyze how soil functions could be considered, the trade-offs uh, between the expansion of uh, urban areas and uh, ecosystem services, identify good practices, work with the authorities to develop strategies, provide training and skills, and also tools and information. So I think I'm, I stop here. This is just for, for the record. So some links where you can find more information. And also in the in presentation, I put more projects that could also contribute to this uh, collaboration. So I stop here. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Thanks for your suggestions regarding this um, funding opportunities and um, inspirations with um, uh, regional ballets. And um, uh, it's uh, very surprising to have the, this big list of 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 um, of cap um, um, uh, groups uh, working on soil. And um, I think that we can find many many tools and with also with the examples within mission uh, CSA's uh, projects that are um, uh, paving the way for for the living labs. <clears throat> so now I'm going to pass the floor from this perspective in, in uh, mission soil. And now we are going to speak from the perspective of the smart specialization strategies and how they impact in mission. So uh, now I'm going to leave the floor to Susana Elena Perez. Uh, that is going to um, uh, uh, send us a perspective from the S3 community of practice, um, the smart specialization community of practices. So, um, uh, Susana Elena Perez. Hello, your, good morning, hello, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Yes, we good. hear so, you and we can see your presentation. Okay, so that's go great. Ahead. So, Thank you very much, Christina, Mighty, and all the team from uh, from the seat for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work on the smart specialization community of practice. Um, it's a very challenging uh, topic what we are uh, presenting today. I'm very glad that uh, I'm the third of the speakers, so that uh, they both uh, provided a very well uh, framework to understand how these species are. So I will make an effort to contextualize the pieces of the puzzle as we see it from the smart specialization point of view. I'm Susana Elena Perez. I work as a senior researcher, senior researcher at the EFI Center, which is a, a boutique consulting company based in Brussels with headquarters in Brussels, but I'm physically in Seville in the south of Spain. I'm also part uh, uh, of the S3 COP, as we call it, the uh, Smart Specialization Community of Practice team. It's a project that is run by the Rio and is uh, the central knowledge and information hub for smart specialization. So I will uh, try to incorporate uh, the ideas that we are working on within the project in the context of the EU mission. So I will go uh, quickly through the introduction because the, the previous uh, colleagues presented uh, the, the general framework. Then I will uh, try uh, to picture the different uh, um, policy, con uh, policy instruments and context and the S3 process in it. I will... Uh, have a quick review about how soil mission has been done uh, till now. And then I will um, stop uh, a bit to explain what is really a smart specialization, how this can be understood in this new framework of missions. And I will uh, provide some of the instruments that we are working on uh, in the estrico right now. <clears throat> and then I will conclude with some uh, uh, conclusions. So um, I'm not going to uh, say more about EU missions because this was explained <clears throat> before me, but I want just to uh, make the point that uh, EU missions actually are um, 
a way to bring very concrete solution to some of the greatest challenges that we are dealing with in our societies now. Uh, particularly, the, the soil mission that was mentioned uh, aims to establish these 100 living labs and lighthouses and try to move forward uh, the healthy soils uh, with the target of uh, 2030. While smart specialization strategies, we call it S3 now, are actually an important tested ground for this new generation of challenge-oriented R&D policies. So we see smart specialization as a policy space to experiment with and to implement new approaches that actually support transformative innovation. So my effort today will be to try to make this a little bit more clear for, from, for the audience and then, of course, uh, to discuss in the in the question and answer uh, session that we have afterwards. This is a, a picture that tried to visualize how all these many initiatives, projects, uh, understanding approaches are from the EU priority to the EU policies and programs, and then seeing how these EU missions, particularly the one uh, uh, in soils, is also plays into the national S3 strategies and goes also to the regional, to the uh, local um, arena. And it's very nice to see that in between this uh, national S3 and regional S3, we have this concept of S3 missions that is uh, uh, explained in a very recent uh, study that my colleague from EFIS, Alex Der Reit, uh, included and presented this multi-level governance uh, and context. So I think this is important for all of us to really understand how all these pieces are in this big puzzle of uh, uh, EU programs and initiatives. So EU missions and S3 are part of the same puzzle, but we are not clearly sure yet, and I think this workshop is really, really important because we need to see how this actually is integrated in practice, in, in, in practical uh, 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 perspective in the territories. The EU missions can actually strengthen the dictionary, uh, directionality and transformation ambition in a smart specialization while a smart specialization can foster policy experimentation and learning in real, in concrete territories. So how this is actually happening, sometimes in parallel, some, sometimes simultaneously, and how to cross a uh, uh, check that we are going in the right direction with these two big elements of the puzzle is what bring us today. So let me say something about the, the soil mission. Um, uh, in, at the EFIS Center, we led a, a very recent study that uh, uh, was very recently published on the assessment of uh, the EU missions. Uh, the, the, the reports were published uh, at the end of uh, last year, and we have a, a, a full report for the EU missions program in general, and then one uh, report for each of the missions. So the one uh, in, in soil missions, we assess the different elements. So today I just uh, uh, bring the elements that I think are more important in order to understand how this is linked or could be uh, potentially linked to S3 uh, at regional level. Soil mission, I think uh, most of the audience today uh, participate in one way or another to the soil, uh, let's say, community. I think the soil mission, and is it clearly uh, highlighted in the report, has a very well-defined vision and goal, but also very relevant objectives to address this challenge. Uh, now is progressively uh, being recognized as a present topic. And I think uh, this is very important because 
it had little progress uh, uh, some years ago, but I think now it's increasingly important. I think uh, member states and regions are more aware of uh, the importance of this topic. And I think, again, this type of events um, are uh, actually addressing uh, the, the, the right uh, topic and is uh, uh, getting more visible. I think uh, it's very important to highlight as well that one of the main strengths of this mission is that it, it builds on a coherent research and innovation strategy that is linked to the living labs and the and the and the lighthouse. And this is important because it tends to be on experimentation. And this is one of the links that we want to make with smart specialization because this mission promotes place a specific solution, which actually is linked directly to the, let's say, uh, uh, approach that is behind the uh, smart specialization strategies, that is place-based. And understand that this is related to what is happening in the regions and how the regions can contribute through the smart specialization strategies to a broader uh, mission. In terms of um, uh, the governance structure, uh, I just uh, put uh, the picture that is included also in the report, so you can explore it a little bit more afterwards. Uh, it looks quite complex, but it's very well articulated. Actually, the arrangements done within these governance structures for policy coordination among the uh, Commission DGs is uh, very well done and it fosters real synergies within the uh, EC uh, uh, DGs related to environment and climate. In terms of uh, governance, uh, I think we can clearly say that this brought some successful stories and this is clearly reflected in the integration of the mission soil in more than a dozen Green Deal strategies and as well in 18 of the 28 National Common Agricultural Policy uh, strategic plans. So I think this is already something very important to highlight today, that this is moving and this is taking a shape uh, in the integration in real strategies. However, still the policy makers at, let's say, national, subnational level in certain countries are not sufficiently aware of the mission. Uh, we have Extremadura here, which is uh, one uh, uh, of the leading regions uh, in this topic in the, in the countries. And I saw some comments also in the chat uh, asking for more involvement of our ministry at, uh, uh, in Spain at national level to engage with this. So I think we are here today to get engaged all these policy makers that are not really aware of the importance of this and maybe they lack of the uh, uh, instruments or the, uh, let's say, tools that we have in order to make this happen in the territories. Uh, so just taking some of the main conclusions, uh, conclusions from these reports, we will say that the mission is both needed and suitable a start for initiating mobilizing and aligning EU and national and regional policy efforts. So in this case, again, a smart specialization is very well placed to actually play this role at the regional uh, and national uh, effort. The design of the mission goes beyond the research and innovation programming toward a more impact-oriented direction. And this is actually very, very important because it's not only about research and innovation programs, but also to have the impact. And the mission already have some solid mechanisms that are able to put uh, in place in some areas to connect, to link the various players that are in this uh, arena including, of course, the Commission, but also the national level and the regional level. And here, uh, it was mentioned also by the previous speakers, by uh, uh, Luis as well, that 
soil uh, land managers and also land owners are a very important stakeholder here. And in some cases that we will see, they are not fully involved and fully aware of all the uh, initiatives that are taking place at regional level linked to the smart specialization strategy. So um, here you have uh, the the link directly to the to the study. Uh, I know that the presentations will be shared in the website of the project, so you have direct links to to all the sources that I'm mentioning. So again, we need to uh, raise awareness because it's still rather low. And uh, we need to make sure that the portfolio of policy actions that is already very extensive and coherent is actually reinforcing the links that we want. So let me check here. So now that we have clear the strengths and the weaknesses of the mission from this perspective, let's see what is happening at regional level with the concept of a smart specialization. Uh, Luis also mentioned some of the uh, uh, actions that we are taking with the um, S3 community of practice. But just let me get a little bit deeper into some of them. A smart specialization is a place-based approach. And this is uh, something that I want to make very clear because in this smart specialization concept, the main aim is to identify the strategy areas or the priorities for the regions and member states for intervention. And this is not done. This identification is not done from a, a top-down approach, but is following a bottom-up uh, approach, following what we call the entrepreneurial discovery process. So when all the stakeholders in the region are involved, and then after a score analysis of the regions, then the priorities are in place, and then the regional uh, authorities put in place programs, initiatives, etc., to channel all this. But the priorities should be very, very clear. And this is something that, uh, as we will see, uh, we need to be aware of because not all the players in soil are really aware of the strategies or of, of the regions. And uh, in some cases, soil does not appear as such in some of the regions that are actually contributing a lot to the soil EU mission. So we need to make the link and we need to be able to link the strategies of our region with the, uh, with the mission. In this context of smart specialization, as I mentioned before, uh, DG Rio launched what is called the Smart Specialization Community of Practice, S3 COP, as the central node for guidance, networking, assistance, support, and we are offering a wide range of services to the different stakeholders, not only uh, regional authorities, but also at national level and other type of stakeholders, including, of course, university, research centers, Business. Uh, there is someone with the micro on, I guess. Thank you. Uh, here you have also uh, the link to the uh, to the community of practice. As I said before, I'm part of uh, the Estricop Secretariat, and we work directly with DG Rijo to implement all this. Um, some of you are involved in the different activities that uh, we are doing. Um, coordinating as part of the s cop the working groups on the enabling condition. We are working specifically on three key aspects, on innovation diffusion, on industrial transition, and on interregional collaboration. And I think the three of them, the three uh, working groups are very relevant for uh, soil mission. And in some uh, areas, uh, uh, interregional collaboration could be especially important for uh, what you are doing, because obviously we cannot address this challenge just in our territory, but in collaboration with the rest of the players outside our, uh, let's say, regional or national boundaries, but also industrial transition. 
So let's see from um, from what we are doing in Estico, what are the, 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 the instruments that can be useful for you? Luis already mentioned the observatory. We launched the observatory in November 2023 in the S3 uh, forum that we had physically in Barcelona. And now we are going to have the second release uh, in, in February, so in less than a month. And this is what you basically can find in the observatory so far. We are uh, trying to get all the information from all the strategies and all the priorities for all the regions and all the member states across Europe. So in some cases, we are still pulling the information so that you know the, the, uh, the observatory can um, uh, uh, show more information. So again, we rely on you as regional stakeholders to be sure that everything that is provided by the observatory is up to date. And of course, I invite you to go through what is already published, look for uh, your region and see what is there. And as you can see in the picture, you can uh, filter by keywords. So I just put soil as one of the keywords of, of uh, soil uh, uh, mission. And as you can see, the first uh, 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 search you can find uh, the program for smart specialization uh, that appears here. And then here you have the links to everything that they're doing, to the strategy and to all the priority. But also you can uh, filter by territories. You can look for yourself, what is in your region. Also economic classification and scientific classification. The scientific classification is especially important because there is one that is addressing uh, 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 soil protection and land protection as such. So you can filter directly by, by that. Of course, you can have uh, uh, also another filters like the European industrial ecosystem. So here, I think uh, uh, um, in the very near future, the observatory will be a very powerful tool for you to find partners, to understand the strategies of other regions outside your uh, territory to see what are the key elements that are put in place. And this will allow you to uh, benchmark your, your activities, to uh, find um, partners for possible collaborations, and actually to link yourself in your region with your territory. In each of the regions, you have a contact point at regional level and also at national level, and you can contact directly this person to get engaged in this activity. Also to be consulted as part of uh, the EDP to be sure that this uh, uh, is reflected as a priority in your region. Because of course, if it's not reflected, and there are many cases in which even though you are doing a lot of efforts, you are running different initiatives and projects. This is not recognized as such as one of the priorities. So the first link that we need to make is to be sure what is happening in our region. Uh, sorry, uh, Susana. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. When it's just to um, finish in because we are at 10 minutes out of time, please. Yeah. I will, I, I am finalizing already. Another um, um, uh, instrument or uh, uh, element that you uh, will find in the S3 COP are the thematic platforms. You have here the link as well. You can see what is already there, all the different platforms that are currently running. And I invite you also to go through this and contact me directly if you want to uh, if you need some uh, advice or guidance in how to create a new platform on, on soil. Uh, so the, the idea that I wanted to bring today, and with this I finalize uh, this, is that mission-oriented innovation policies are key element, is a key element in the implementation of the S3, that entrepreneurial discovery process is very important to listen to all the stakeholders. And so you as key stakeholders should be part of this entrepreneurial discovery process in your regions and countries. And that there are uh, um, uh, already some frameworks that could be actually very helpful for you to understand how transformative missions can 
actually uh, uh, give a, street, a stronger direction. The mission-oriented road mapping is an example of this. You can find this in the uh, study uh, that I have uh, at the end with the, with the direct lead. Again, however, we have a long way to, to link both, uh, both uh, uh, um, uh, instruments, policies, and contexts. S3 is still uh, focus on supporting basically uh, uh, technological innovation. So we need also to move our approach toward uh, environmental, economic, and social transition. S3 governance in general has limited capacity to actually orchestrate it and mediate tension between the bottom-up and the top-down approaches. Remember S3 as bottom-up and EU mission as, as, as uh, more top-down. Uh, governance and EDP uh, includes not as frequent as we would like civil society and citizens. And in this way, I think land owners and managers are part of the stakeholders that need to be consulted both for this particular uh, strategy. And um, the policy mix that uh, uh, the S3 has is uh, uh, limited uh, uh, today and is supporting basically su supply side instruments for R&D. So we need to work harder on complementarities uh, as we are doing today. We need to establish better multi-level governance to orchestrate better all these top-down and bottom-up approaches. And we need to be sure that in the future, we align in a more clear way S3 and EU missions. And basically, this is it. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank one. you, yeah, thank you, Sus Susana. I think that uh, this uh, uh, quite good presentation to close this uh, initial block because we have uh, this orientation, uh, general orientation of to be um, um, mission oriented in innovation implementation. The focus on the uh, on the um, uh, mission soil and the focus on from the practice of the of the smart specialization. All right, I'm going to to do a short round version because we are out of time of question and an answer to this uh, first round of ex speakers. I have some uh, questions from the private. Uh, so um, uh, one of them uh, is for um, um, uh, Susana that uh, say, um, uh, yes, let me find it because it's from private. Which concrete actions, Susana, can be implemented to reach out and engage regional and local authorities in soil health living labs, particularly in living labs. What's your view or thoughts? Susana? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, getting the living labs and the lighthouses more visibility in the S3 community and policy makers is very, very crucial. And I think um, the effort should be, let's say, from both sizes, but uh, I guess you can start contacting the regional authorities in your own territory that are dealing with the smart specialization to actually include your activities in the pipeline of what they are doing. The entrepreneurial discovery process should include all these stakeholders, but you need to make you visible in the territory. So we, for instance, in the observatory, you will have all this information so you know who to contact and also trying to organize some type of activities together with the smart specialization uh, uh, platform or initiatives or, or office that you have in your territory to be sure that these living labs are actually engaging with the rest of the priorities and they are having very clear uh, initiatives to show to the uh, to the territory itself. You can also go further and try to go for uh, interregional collaboration, trying to get a partnership on or or to get engaged with mutual learning exercises or peer learning uh, activities. And I think by doing that, you are actually putting yourself 
in the agenda of S3, while S3 is in your agenda as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if there are other um, questions from uh, or comments or um, uh, things just to share with the rest of the participants regarding this uh, um, uh, initial um, inspiration um, presentations. Um, I think we are focused now on, on uh, where are we and, and how we can start interactions. Um, uh, again, I'm going to this uh, Miro board uh, link uh, where you can see all the participants for uh, networking with uh, during the meetings directly, uh, bilateral connections, and uh, after the meetings, uh, uh, you, you can um, con um, communicate. Um, do I have any other suggestions, comments for the speakers? Um, if we don't have any other comments on the chat? No, no? there's no, 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 there's no questions in the chat, <clears throat> no hands raised. So we okay. can move forward. Okay, so we are going to continue with the um, um, uh, H1 from the, uh, we already have some um, examples in the uh, presentation of, of uh, regions thinking on, on this, uh, on the, with this perspective, um, uh, it's it's really fruitful. Uh, I mean, and useful, and um, absolutely the map uh, uh, with the classification of the um, smart specialization priorities and and uh, this um, uh, living lab uh, approaches in uh, in real. But now we are going to speak uh, with uh, three different um, 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 uh, uh, representatives from uh, regions and uh, smart specialization. Um, offices uh, where they can uh, uh, with with uh, we try to choose between regions with different uh, priorities related to the objectives of the mission so we are going to start with um, agro um, agriculture um, uh, specialization in the uh, region of Extremadura in Spain so we have here um, uh, Lucila Castro uh, that is project uh, uh, manager and uh, the responsible of of the um, technical uh, support office um, uh, to the regional government in the implementation of the Mars specialization. So my my friend and colleague uh, Lucila, uh, <laughs> thanks for being uh, for being here, and um, you can directly share your screen and and introduce your uh, the experience in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Cristina. Do you hear me well, right? And do you see my presentation, right? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So I'm going to be um, very brief, so because I know we are a little bit behind uh, schedule, and I, I just want to uh, present you the <clears throat> experience that we have in, in Extremadura, uh, mostly uh, regarding our governance and e entrepreneur discovery processes uh, that we are putting in place um, within our smart specialization strategy um, that also help us to foster the soil mission at regional level. So um, very briefly, just for you to know who we are, we are a very uh, pretty much rural uh, region with, with a large territory, but a very, very few uh, inhabitants. Um, and uh, and we um, have a very green region, uh, and 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 therefore uh, ag agri food and and agriculture, it's it's one of our our main uh, um, smart specialization areas, as I'm going to show you in in uh, in a minute. But uh, in terms of in terms of uh, socioeconomic context, we have a low GDP. Um, with an unfortunate, unfortunately, a high unemployment rate, and more than 99% of our companies are SMEs. As I mentioned before, very linked with the agriculture um, sector, and have, and with a less developed in, in the industry sector, right? Um, so in this context, um, in terms of R and R and D or R and I, um, we are a less developed region for. The cohesion criteria and we um, the, uh, structural funds are of great importance in 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 our region. Um, in this sense, smart specialization strategy um, was an uh, important opportunity for us to uh, focus on our main resources in terms of uh, research and innovation, and that is why um, I'm presenting here. 
this uh, tree in, in which we represent our smell precision pattern. Uh, as you can see, the soil in the in the tree is is pretty much based on um, um, our sci scientific specialization, and and that 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 gives the the. Uh, uh, strength to our tree to grow uh, through the technological specialization and then to the economic specialization in which you can see these branches uh, in which agri-food is, is one of the main ones. So um, in which the, the focus of my presentation of today is uh, how we manage our governance uh, model and our entrepreneurial discovery processes um, to um, involve a large number of stakeholders in these issues uh, before uh, in Mati Mat Mat uh, mentioned these collaborative uh, platforms in um, in his presentation. Thank you for that. And uh, I will try to explain you a little bit how are we approaching this uh, at regional level. So, um, well, these are very briefly the, the, the four uh, strategic objectives of the of our smart position in which you can see that uh, the deployment of the entrepreneurial discovery process is one of our um, four main objectives, strategic objectives for, for our strategy. So uh, the focus on the involvement of the stakeholders um, is from the very beginning um, embedded in, in our strategy. We want it to, to um, uh, have it as a central point of the strategy because we understood that in, in, in with the characteristics of our of our region the the involvement of our, of our stakeholders uh, was a crucial uh, was a key issue to to better deploy the the specialization and the strategy um, in in the region so uh, here you can see a very briefly the the uh, uh, image of how our um, governance model is working so it's in spanish but you can see here at the top of the governance model uh, the the strategic level then we have a coordination level and support level here and a participatory a participatory level uh, in which of course the these all three levels are are, are connecting uh, all the time um uh, from top down to bottom up um but i would like to to focus on the on the participatory level in which these uh, collab collaborative platforms are are uh, taking part so what are the collab the collaborative platforms they are uh, a space for the effective development of the entrepreneurial discovery process this is the result of a of an improvement of our governance model in the previous programming period in the previous programming period we uh, created um, created some uh, working groups around our uh, smart specialization areas, but we understood that we needed to um, to implement something more horizontal in which um, uh, we can work in a more coordinated ways and avoiding that uh, ways uh, working on silos. So uh, the approach was to uh, address specific challenges of relevance for 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 the agents of the R and D system. Um, the beneficiaries of these uh, platforms are, of course, the stakeholders uh, from the from the quadruple helix um, that might be interested in any of the challenges that uh, we are. Um, proposing in, in in the platforms um what we what we try to do is to um put all the people interested in in some specific issue uh, to work together in order to try to um find possible solutions to 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 those challenges and the, the expected result of these platforms of course is um um, to work in these um, in in collaborative pro uh, projects or initiatives that may help us to um, uh, to solve these uh, challenges I, I was mentioning before, we have a, a design uh, of these uh, platforms in a very collaborative way in which different stakeholders were involved in the in the design uh, of the of the uh, platforms. Uh, then we. Um, implement these um, these uh, platforms creating both face-to-face uh, -face spaces but also an online tool that help us to um, keep 
track of the work that uh, we do with the stakeholders. And then, of course, uh, the, the uh, dynamization uh, part in which we are pretty much involved right now at regional level, um, working on specific um, initiatives that are already uh, in the platforms. So very briefly, the mission, as I mentioned before, was to promote, create, consolidate, and manage collaborative processes uh, to encourage and strengthen the entrepreneurial discovery processes in the region. Um, how with these collaborative platforms that will uh, that are interconnecting companies technologies knowledge in order to to exchange ideas and to identify pos uh, possibilities for collaboration and and create new opportunities at regional level for our stakeholders um these are the different spaces i was mentioning before but i'm not going to board you with this i think we can see here uh, how is the um the the process that 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 uh, within the, the 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 platform in which we we can have uh, for instance a face-to-face -face event in which different ideas can come uh, and then we can have some co-creation uh, workshops and then we can upload these initiatives in the platform and keep working on an online mode and then organizing some other face-to-face -face, uh, workshops or meetings to go a little bit more in depth in this and then start the loop all over again. So this is a very, and we can start, and we can start in any of these points. I mean, it's not mandatory to start with a with a face-to-face -face meeting. We can start just with an, an initiative uh, that has been uploaded in, in the platform. And so it's very dynamic uh, this way. Um, so very briefly, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm recapping with the other presentations. Also, Luis mentioned uh, UMUS uh, project. Um, in Extremadura is part of FUMUS project, and this is um, a soil mission project um, we are working on. Um, it's, a, it's a regional community for the um, soil health. So uh, what we did is uh, we created this space in the, in the collaborative platform in which we invited um, Different stakeholders to to join us and to work in the in the in this community and to discuss issues related with uh, with this community, and and so the collaborative platform is already working with uh, some initiatives specifically related with uh, soil with the soil mission. This is one of uh, of the of the projects um and i think it's it, it's good that i i choose this one because already luis mentioned it but we are also working on decarbonization and other other uh, initiatives and of course some other more transversal initiatives related with with uh, agri food and so on that help us to put uh, the stakeholders together on the same table to discuss uh, issues that are of common um, interest and try to find the best possible solution to um, to this. So I think this is what, what we wanted to do is to show you this because we believe this is an, a nice approach to uh, uh, find synergies between the soil mission and the smart specialization strategies at regional level that will help us to put all the stakeholders uh, together in uh, in the same discussion, you know, and so we can uh, find um, uh, possible uh, working lines or solutions or even other challenges um, to work uh, on. So that's that's all from my side. If you have any questions about the platform or if you want further details, do not do not hesitate and contact me or any of us in Fundesit and we will be happy to give you further information. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that is really a um, good example of this connection, um, collaborative platforms uh, that are uh, S3 tools uh, with um, a ch a concrete uh, creating communities uh, are at local levels uh, for EU mission uh, soil. I think that, so thank you so much. Um, we are going to continue uh, starting from this region uh, um, uh, based on uh, agriculture. We are going to continue now uh, with examples of op uh, operational 
national initiatives uh, using um, uh, specialization uh, in the in a region that is uh, focused on on forestry. So I'm going just to leave the floor to um, Eva, that is the the following um, um, speaker with an uh, uh, a regional good practice in in forestry. Uh, uh, Eva uh, Skagen start is the, from the forestry and good department uh, uh, in the county governor of in 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 London, in Norway. So Eva, uh, please, uh, um, you can now share your, uh, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, we already have your presentation. So thank you, Eva. Thank you. Oh, wait. do you hear me now? Perfect. Now we can thank see you. the presentation and hear you. Go ahead. Fine. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to present our project. Uh, it's a small practical example, literally down to earth. Uh, it's about scarification and the effect on the carbon balance in the forest ecosystem in Norway. My name is Eva Skagestad and I'm the head of the section of forestry at the county governor of Inlande in Norway. And um, before I go into the details about the project, uh, I will briefly introduce Inlande and our resources. Try to... There, I think. You have a, a yeah. map yeah. on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, the total area of Inlande is about 20% of the Norway's total area. And uh, it's uh, actually 1.7 times the size of Belgium. So it's quite big. And it's about uh, the 26% of the productive forest in Norway is in Inland. Uh, so and um, Inland is a part of the boreal forests. And uh, on a Norwegian scale, Inland is very important for the forestry. And the map to the right illustrates this. But the amount of harvested cubic meters of wood visualized as area on the map. As you see, uh, the northern and the western parts of Norway are very thin. It's a very little uh, production of wood there. But uh, in Inland, we have about 42% of the production. So forestry is therefore, of course, important for employment and value creation in Inland. We have a long tradition of using wood as a building material and also, also uh, in the processing industry. And we have our own uh, R&D specialists in this region. And we have a strategy to further develop uh, the forest industry and to help us ensure that the sustainable raw material from the forest uh, has the lowest possible climate footprint we have initiated this project. Uh, in in Lana, scarification is used as a soil uh, preparation to improve the survival of the plants planted after clear cut felling in spruce forests. Uh, we do this because scarification provides good planting sites by increased ground temperature, reduce risk of drought, reduce damage from beetles, and so on. Uh, and in practice, uh, we make such a, a piles. Uh, uh, where we can put the plants. And we know a lot about uh, the effect of scarification uh, on plant survival, but very little about the effect it has below the ground on soil carbon. So that's why we have uh, initiated this project. We want to find out what are the short-term and the long-term effects of uh, scarification on soil carbon in Norway. Um, um, and then I mean, you maybe ask, why do this in Norway? Uh, is this, uh, isn't this um, uh, studied other places? Well, the loss of carbon after disturbances seem to be linked to the amount of soil carbon. And based on data from Sweden, Finland, and Norway, carbon stock in Norway is uh, the forest soil in Norway appear to be smaller than in the other countries. This may mean that the result from our neighbor lands cannot be used in Norway. So that's why we do this here. Because uh, loss of soil carbon uh, in Norway forest uh, after scarification has not previously been measured. 
Uh, this project uh, is a uh, uh, collaboration between uh, both stakeholders in the forest owners. It's uh, actually owned by uh, a private owners organization called Glommen Mjøsen Skog. Uh, while the Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy Research uh, is responsible for the, for the research part. And we in the uh, county governor, we have the lead of the project. We also uh, cooperate with the Norwegian University of Life and Science, our local in university, and the Norwegian Forestry Extension Service Institute, uh, in addition to two other forest organizations. So this is a, a, a very nice um, example for uh, example for a collaboration project. So um, it's um, a project that uh, I, I'll show you how uh, this uh, in practice is done. Um, scarification is uh, done out in the forest by uh, in two methods, uh, by the excavator that you see to the left on the picture or by uh, a disc trencher uh, on the forwarder as you see on the right side. In our project, we will test both of them uh, and compare that to a control uh, plot without uh, scarification. And the, the first part of the project uh, we did last year was to select two locations with the representative forest types with spruce ready for harvesting in Norway, in Inlande. And this is uh, one of the forests we choose. We have two locations. And this is... Uh, uh, how the setup is uh, in the project. The both locations uh, are divided into four blocks and each of them um, will test out the different methods. The three um, uh, different uh, routes are um, excavator, uh, disc transfer, and then uh, also a control because we want to find out what kind of um, uh, carbon um, situation we also have in the uh, part without scarification. Each month, uh, we then go out and measure um, the soil respiration and soil moisture, and also the temperature. And we did it last year before uh, it is deforestated. And this winter, it, uh, uh, we have clear cut the, the field and then uh, this summer, we will uh, also do the same um, measurements. Uh, and in the autumn, we will uh, scarificate the, the field and um, plant. And next summer, we will also do the same measurements just to find out uh, how the um, respiration and the moisture and also temperature uh, is uh, reacting on the different uh, types of uh, actions. This is the machine we are using uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, measure um, the um, carbon flux. We will also uh, collect soil samples, or we have done uh, this year, uh, um, not this year, last year, in the autumn of uh, uh, last year. Uh, we wanted to take some uh, um, samples and also we made some um, uh, profiles and this is to find out um, to estimate the carbon and the nitrogen stocks and to find out uh, how um, the, the stone content of the of the soil and as you see at the picture this autumn was very very wet and we had an extreme weather uh, called hans in uh, August and it was raining all the autumn afterwards. So as you see, the to make these uh, profiles was quite difficult. Uh, they were filled with water uh, at the same time you dig them out. So, but we we managed to do what we wanted to. So as I said, uh, the, uh, the goal now is to uh, next summer. Uh, the picture shows uh, how it looked like now after uh, the felling. And uh, we have then the 
plan is to go out to the summer and do the measurements uh, and also uh, uh, do scarification in the autumn and then plant uh, with the spruce. Uh, uh, this um, the, the 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 soil samples and the profiles the, we will uh, do only once in the project. Uh, it's because it's a uh, it changed very little in so that short time, but hopefully the experiments and the locations can become part of a long term research, so that um, we can follow them up for several decades to come to uh, find out how the, the carbon uh, stock is uh, in 10 or 20 years after uh, the forestation. So uh, this is very ex uh, exciting for us. We will uncover and increase, uh, um, we will try to uncover how this uh, actions uh, um, affect on carbon. And we hope to find out uh, if, um, it's a large or a little effect, and, and this will uh, then um, affect uh, how much uh, scarification we want to do in the future. So that was uh, my example. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think that uh, could contribute from the um, real and concrete example and how to manage in the in this um, involvement of, of many stakeholders in the practical point of view. And now we are going to uh, move to uh, Portugal, uh, to Central uh, Region, uh, Sofia and Edgar. They are going to, to serve the uh, presentations on uh, post-industrial uh, good practice at, at regional level. On one hand, Sofia Patricio is the head of division from, for promotion, innovation, and regional competitiveness in the CCDRC. Uh, there is the, the Center for Development in the uh, Central Region in, in, in Portugal. And Edgar Carval, Carvalho is the uh, Director of the Technical Department of ED, EDM, a uh, mining development company that is based in this uh, region. So they are going to share this example from um, uh, between uh, they both. So uh, directly, uh, Sophie, uh, please, if you uh, would like just to, I'm seeing already your presentation. So uh, if you want just to go ahead. Yeah, great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of CCDRC for the invitation, of course. And congratulations for all the amazing work that everyone is doing out there. So I'm Sophie Patricio from Central Region of Portugal, working on CCDRC, which is a regional uh, public institute. We are actually the coordinators of our smart specialization strategy, Century S3, and CCDRC is also the managing authority uh, of the regional program of, of Centro. So we are going to present a regional good practice based on the post-industrial phase from my side, I'm just going to very briefly present you our, our um, S3, which at first, it seems a, a bit complex uh, at first, but I, I think I can actually simplify it answering uh, three questions, which are what, how, and where, and what we want to achieve with our S3. It's these green, light green boxes, we want to contribute, ideally all projects supported should contribute to the green digital and social transition. How can we do that for us and considering our regional context is through these innovation hubs. So by valorizing natural indigenous resources, by the development of sustainable industrial solutions, by mobilizing technologies for quality of life and promoting territorial innovation and where uh, in the priority domains where we know that we have productive capacity installed or that we are able to actually produce science and research or they can be more emerging uh, domains where we know that there are interesting dynamics happening in, in, in Centro and that we can not ignore on the contrary that we should highlight to keep promoting them and space is a good example of that. In our innovation hubs, and just to give you some more context, we have these lines of ac actions because if you look to the development of sustainable industrial solutions, for instance, this is still very broad. And we have these lines of action giving examples of exactly what we mean, exactly what we want to promote and to support within this line, within these innovation hubs. They are like the path 
uh, that we want to follow. And we, use, we usually say that they are our transformative agendas for Centre Region. The big question is if soils are actually present in Centre Region. And if we consider that uh, Centre represents 32% of Portugal mainland, that we have the biggest area of forest in Portugal, the biggest agricultural area in Portugal mainland, and the second biggest number of water bodies. And of course, that the region, unfortunately, is suffering from different structural challenges that are leading to the abandonment of, of rural areas. And that can actually also lead to soils desertification, especially if we consider climate changes and wildfires that uh, unfortunately the region has been suffering in the last uh, in the last few years. Of course, that the answer is clear. Yes, soils are present in our S3. And if it wasn't for all of this, um, and this is a, a quote that, that I took from our, one of the publications online, Life on Earth depends on healthy soils. They are the basis of our food and provide other vital ecosystems services. So of course, even if it wasn't for all of this, I'm, I'm convinced that soils would be present in our S3 anyway. Uh, how, where are they, where are soils? I mean, they are pretty much, if you look at the domains, they are pretty much everywhere. And they are mentioned, if you read our document itself, with a lot of pages, they are pretty much mentioned everywhere. They are, of course, mentioned in health and well-being, in culture and tourism, in energy and climate, in space, in the materials. I would say, though that they, they are more obvious in the valorization of natural endogenous resources and in the natural resources and, and bioeconomy and very briefly in one minute. Uh, for instance, in the valorization of natural endogenous resources in our lines of actions, what do we say to our stakeholders is that they need to innovate and to have projects that innovate on the knowledge mapping and monitoring of these natural resources, but also on the preservation, on the protection and recovery of these resources and on the valorization and circular and sustainable use of, of our resources. If we go and read the details that are behind these three dots, it becomes very obvious that the soils, that although we want to promote these in all natural industrial resources, that the soils are the basis for everything. Regarding the natural resources and bioeconomy, we have three subdomains. I think we can call them that way, water, agri-food and forest. And I, I mean, I think it is clear that we cannot talk about one of these without talking about soils. They are completely interlinked. But just to give you some really concrete examples, uh, for each one of our uh, domains, subdomains, we have identified very simple and clear relevant areas of integration, and soils are explicitly mentioned in this. Uh, for instance, we have protection and, and formation of soils and its biodiversity, the smart and efficient, efficient protection use and management uh, uh, of soils. Now, going to our good practice, which I think is the most important in this interesting part, actually, we are focusing in the, in the mining industry in, in Sint region. Um, and just to give you a, a quick glimpse, um, mining is actually an important sector for Sint. It is a traditional sector, I think we can say that. Uh, but that in the local areas where we have mining industries, they have an important social and they are an important social and cultural element and of course an economic they have an economic importance as well as they still create jobs and opportunities so in this map i could have this is two pictures that are taken from uh, national databases but we could have uh, a completely different web map with a lot of different colors they, these are just uh, two of, of, of the statistics that are chosen. So in red, we have the mining concession and in this light purple, we have the uranium occurrence and we can see here Portugal, the entire map. And I think it's pretty obvious that we have a lot of mining industry concentrated in Centre region, especially when we are talking about uh, uranium. In this other map, we have in blue, the abandoned mining areas and in red, the abandoned mining areas with uh, activity. And again, we can see that they are very focused and very concentrated in Saint region, which actually means that we do have a problem and that we need to tackle this problem and to actually recognize it. 
so I will now give the floor to Edgar. I will need to leave in a couple of minutes, I'm so sorry. But if someone has any question, I have uh, my email address in the first slide. So please get in touch. I will be more than happy to, to answer by email to all your questions and comments. Uh, Edgar will present the practical example of the environmental remediation of the Ushedisa mining in this uh, mining area. So please, uh, Edgar. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. And Thank you so much also for the invitation to share uh, our case study and what uh, we have been doing in the past 20 years in the central region in the remediation of this uh, uranium mining um, uh, legacy sites. So let me just confirm with you if you are seeing the presentation. Yes, yeah. we can see. Okay. So as uh, I'm going to, to explain you, um, EDM is a state-owned company and we are responsible for the remediation of all mining legacy sites uh, in Portugal. And of course, this includes the central region. And as Sophie was mentioning, central region is a very rich uh, in terms of uh, mineral resources, including uranium uh, deposits. So uh, this includes the granitic formation, Exidian uh, age uh, formations, where the uh, uranium mineralizations have been found, but also the tin and wolframitic uh, province with uh, uh, wolfram and uh, uh, tungsten uh, mineralizations, but I will focus more on the uranium mineralizations. So as Sophie has shown, um, we have uh, identified 286 occurrences of uranium deposits uh, in the central region and 62 or, or in Portugal and 62 were actually mined in the central region uh, in the right uh, map in the red dots, the same map that uh, Sophie has already shown. So on these uh, uranium mines or radium mines, because in the first half of the 20th century, these mines were actually uh, mined to produce radium salt. So uh, uh, impressive amount of 50 grams of radium salt was were produced until 1944 and then the production changed to, to uranium ore concentrate for um, mainly for uh, energy production so and we have on this uh, 62 mine sites every type of situations with underground mine pits open pits uh, uh, both also in the same location sometimes and also uh, some innovative solutions at that time which led also to a different type of legacy uh, and problems which are in situ leaching with acidic solutions and some of the exhausted uh, deposits so this of course resulted in a very complex situation uh, in these areas so we have uh, uranium exploitation that started in 1907 so as you may imagine the the knowledge about the effects of radioactivity and about also the, the state of the art of mining at that time was not the same that we have today so this uh, led to villages grew around the mines to people moving to 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 find better jobs and better um, uh, quality of life but also at the end of the abandonment of these mines it was left with existing exposure situations in terms of radiation exposure uh, environmental liabilities degraded mining infrastructures and also complex social situation after the mine closure and all the jobs that were um, left behind so this of course also led to social pressure uh, uh, by the old workers and some mistrust about this remediation process that was about to begin so it was in uh, all of this complex situation and without uh, with some of these examples in terms of environmental liability and impacts in terms of uh, mining waste, tailing dams, waste rock, but also degraded infrastructures and, uh, of course, soil contamination and impacts in terms of uh, habitats and, and, and landscape. So this uh, complex situation led, led to the government to, to initiate what was the concession for environmental remediation of the uranium legacy sites in Portugal in 2001. So this had different objectives, of course, to eliminate the risk factors for public health and safety, but also for the environment through the rehabilitation of the surrounding landscape and natural conditions whenever this was necessary to ensure the preservation of significant heritage and cultural aspects, but also to promote and provide conditions for future use of these reclaimed, reclaimed areas, depending on, on its potential. So such as agricultural forestry use for tourist or cultural promote, promotion, or also another use that could promote the community development. So there was already here the concern to promote this uh, integrated uh, development of these areas. And here, because we don't have much time, I'll just show you some examples of, uh, of uh, our remediation and focusing on Urshelisa, which was the main center for uranium production in the central region. So there's some pictures of uh, before and after. And as you may see, all these areas were uh, remediated to 
a safe uh, state and of course promoting the rehabilitation and requalification of the of the sites these are were two uh, telling stems where the mining waste from almost 100 years of mining exploitation were were deposited and now they are uh, safely deposited and safely stored for the future and this was the industrial area of Urgeri, so where all the uranium ores were processed so as you may see this has been completely uh, remediated and requalified for future uses and some of our perspectives for this uh, old mining area is to promote also the industrial tourism this is related with the history of this site and the culture uh, mining culture around these communities so it is has been identified as a relevant end use uh, by the communities by the local municipalities and of course uh, with the region and is integrated already in the guide to the portuguese geological mining points of interest for data dominus which you uh, you can see online and integrates also other points from all over the country uh, but also contributes to the preservation of the mining heritage infrastructures and this culture uh, with the history of uranium mining and milling that could be preserved uh, also uh, in this uh, um, center for uh, of museum for uranium mining in the that we are planning to to develop and to implement in the future and this will also contribute to the promotion of the socio-economic development of these areas fixating the population uh, uh, in this de degraded uh, area also it contributes to foster a sense of ownership and community so people that work uh, in the mining uh, in the mines in the past or they have, uh, have had their uh, parents or grandparents working in the mines see that this history is not being forgotten and that they can continue to see some of these infrastructures now being used for different uh, uses which will also honor the memory of their uh, grandfathers and previous generations on uh, that they have worked in the uranium mining so this is one of the important aspects about this uh, this uh, uh, area is the creation of the uranium mining museum uh, utility, uh, using the previous infrastructures which were really in bad shape and really contaminated but they were able to be preserved after uh, a strong decontamination effort and rehabilitation as you may see so it's now also an ex libris and a, a point of interest for uh, this region and this community also other aspects that we are uh, promoting and developing is to use some of these areas that uh, cannot be used for different uh, end uses like the waste telling dams to install uh, solar panels uh, this way we can promote the generation of renewable energy using uh, gray areas that cannot be used for different uh, end uses without uh, degrading other uh, soils and other ecosystems that uh, are uh, what like uh, it is happening in other uh, areas of portugal in, in the world where some of natural areas are being degraded to install solar panels so we should use also this these areas that we already have to uh, rehabilitate them for different uses, such as reduction of renewable energy, but also to promote uh, a research center in Urgeris so using some of our facilities to promote cooperation with universities, uh, receive R&D projects, uh, training activities, laboratories, startup communities, uh, ultimately creating here an innovation hub that could contribute to the smart uh, strategy that Central Region is developing for for this region. Of course, these areas have a lot of other potentials, but they can also be used for other industrial or institutional beneficial reuses. So just to conclude uh, in very short presentation, of course, this is a result of 20 years of, of, uh, of work in the central region that of course have contributed to effective reduction of the risks to public and the environment and they have been have, uh, contributed also to, to the preservation of this uh, important heritage and for the safe beneficial reuse of what was before former degraded areas uh, also from our side it's important to keep an effective stakeholder participation and throughout the remediation process and in the selection of the, the end users and what they want to do with uh, this areas because ultimately these people are the ones that will going to use and make a, a good um, occupation and, and, and benefits also from the remediated areas although it is important and the remediation is complete it's important to to keep some post remediation management activities such as monitoring to keep sure that the remediation is, is sustainable in the long term and that the effects of the previous mining activities do not degrade and, uh, and that they keep in the long term uh, it is also important to ensure co collaborative, proactive, and holistic approach, including all aspects regarding uh, technical, social, and economic 
aspects to make sure that we can effectively contribute to uh, the sustainability of these sites after they have been degraded and contaminated in the past and therefore improving the quality of life in these aspects and the quality of the environment we can also contribute to some, some of the sustainable development goals of the united nations and this is what i had to present to you if you have any questions of course feel free to send me an email or just ask me right now because i still have some time of course to to, to share with you thank you so thank you, thank you so much for the um, uh, your work. Uh, uh, we can say that um, um, mission is re mission oriented approach is recent, uh, but um, uh, um, uh, implementation of solutions for remediation of soils are, are, has uh, are quite longer uh, trajectory. So thanks for sharing with us this perspective for um, the, on the participation of stakeholders that, that are crucial for both areas of of, of knowledge. Uh, today so i i have to say thank you to all the speakers and uh, and thank you to to the um, uh, to the participants because they are all of the uh, liveliness of the of the chat because uh, many of the speakers are receiving and answering in private and uh, in the um, in the in the chat and also uh, uh, publicly so now we are out of time but we always need to have time for uh, please um if you have um uh, questions, uh, you can uh, uh, raise your uh, hand uh, now for the this second block of block uh, of of uh, speakers. Um, uh, so uh, probably or in the chat. So uh, uh, do you have any uh, direct uh, comment or um, questions for the the speakers in this uh, second um, uh, part of the of the event? Uh, I know they are receiving uh, private messages. <laughs> so I know we're off, but um, any questions for the audience? I'm. Uh, I have um, some uh, 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 concrete uh, questions here that has been uh, sent. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it is an open question for the three of you. What are the main challenges that you identify? to foster soil health through the implementation of a smart specialization strategies in your region? What do you think that is the main challenge when you, you that are implementing um, uh, uh, regional strategies? Uh, if you want just to face uh, soil, you are um, doing it in, in many approaches. So just identify any challenge, any difficulties. So how do you see that is the the, the challenge for the, for this or, or what do you want to add lights in terms of, of challenge? Is there something, please, for the three uh, speakers, regional speakers? Well, maybe as I was the first, I, I, I answer first uh, very, very briefly, but uh, I think um, at regional level is um, it's probably easier to identify the challenges because we are um, uh, our R and D ecosystem uh, in, is um, it, I mean we know we know each other pretty well so it's easier to, for us to 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 identify the challenge the challenges what I think is. Uh, the main issue is to keep the people involved in the long term, in, to yeah. to to keep the momentum in the long term, which it's it's sometimes difficult. Uh, but well, we are trying to good, good. to do it. Uh, so yeah, that's probably... yeah because transformative process doesn't happen just in in the yeah. short time. <laughs> yeah, and, and when uh, it's people involved, are maintaining involved in in the the process. Yes, I understand mm -hmm. it. So thank you. Any any other comment uh, from the other speakers regarding the challenge? And uh, I, I probably could be interesting also to refer to this uh, involvement of uh, stakeholders. Any comment or reflection? Well, Probably Sophie will be the, the best person to answer from central region because she's actually in, uh, responsible for the development of this strategy. But I fully agree with, with the comment, uh, with the previous comment. 
involvement of stakeholders is the most important because if we want to make or develop significant uh, strategies we have to make sure that they can be implemented on the ground with the populations with the stakeholders that are really going to benefit them and if we want to make a change this is what i would uh, of course recommend and highlight as the most important otherwise we can do beautiful strategies on the office in in in, in the paper but uh, on the ground if we want to make real changes we have to involve the stakeholders Good, good. Um, I have um, um, an open questions from uh, a colleague from Greece because they want to uh, learn more uh, on the examples uh, in their countries. Probably the S3 platform is a good uh, example. Also, the examples of the uh, um, the examples of the uh, um, um, uh, regional uh, analysis in uh, that has been made in Prepsoil. And now we are going to shortly um, uh, refer a little bit more about we we, we spoke um, in, uh, uh, sometimes in the in the in, uh, in this time about one uh, open initiative in Mission Soil for regional um, uh, dialogue and uh, regional uh, examples uh, that is UMUS project. So if I don't have any writing uh, um, questions um, uh, on the chat, I'm going just to continue with the, uh, some uh, last uh, remarks to the um, audience. Okay, so here, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, somebody can, no? Yes or no? Not, uh, not yet. No, 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 yes. Yes. Oh my God, yes, to check if this work. <laughs> Now, now, now it's fine. Okay, so again, yes, everybody are here. Uh, we have been classified and we have been served uh, our uh, challenges, our orientations through the objectives of the missions, and we have them here for for the future um, uh, uh, interactions. Uh, so we uh, in the uh, list some of the participants are. Uh, are uh, uh, looking actively for uh, partners to participate in 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 projects with different um, uh, purposes and and, and objective, and uh, and the interaction doesn't finish here. Uh, we have the list of the of the people of the registered uh, uh, people and their uh, interests and challenges. But we have a permanent uh, tool um, in Nations Project. Uh, this is a tool that is very uh, well known because it use it in other uh, brokerage events for uh, project proposals. And we have in Nations uh, participating from the last uh, um, call for proposals uh, for living labs uh, in soil, um, and we we will have it available for the next uh, call for proposal in 2024. Um, uh, more than 500 uh, participants is waiting for your interactions for you missing mission soil living lab uh, topics. So it's open. So I invite the, the participant not only just on the debate uh, of uh, with a regional perspective, but also uh, with this uh, living lab um, approach open for everybody. It's linked to the presentation. You can uh, will find it in um, in the mission um, event, and again, if you want just to uh, try to find and to, to have um, um, uh, uh, like a kind of grant and uh, support for uh, fostering the dialogue at local level. Uh, with uh, municipalities and regions and their stakeholders, uh, 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 UMUS uh, project has an open, an internal call for proposal open until the end of February for uh, uh, select uh, uh, 20 pilot pro uh, projects uh, based on this dialogue uh, uh, at local and regional um, level uh, about uh, the protection and restoration of soil health. So I think there is a, a good initiative for the, the audience that we have regions here in the in the event and and uh, you know that we are this is some a uh, thematic and sectorial debate in uh, uh, along the, uh, this uh, December and, and uh, January and February uh, in uh, nations. So uh, all of them are going to be online. So we are uh, the next two ones will be tomorrow. Uh, uh, soil health from a forestry perspective, um, and the, in the 15th of February, the next one on soil uh, decontamination. All the information on the previous one uh, is are going to be in. 
Leading Nations uh, projects. But, uh, and uh, we will have as we uh, our role and our mission and goal is to uh, dynamize and continue dynamizing uh, networking and uh, for uh, uh, projects and initiatives around uh, soil health. We will have the second round on round of national engagement events around um, between March and May. Uh, in the spring time uh, in uh, in the 44 EU member states uh, at a national level for everybody to understand and uh, and uh, and continue applying to the call for proposals and having um, uh, information from the national perspectives. Uh, so we start, uh, we finished it our first round uh, last uh, autumn and now we are initiating our next uh, round for the calls that is uh, near to be uh, open for submission uh, for continue uh, implementing uh, this uh, living lab and, and lighthouses approach uh, for soil health. And if you want not to lose uh, nothing about these uh, relevant uh, tools um, and materials that you have in, in nations, you can just uh, go uh, through the website and you can sub subscribe to, to our newsletters for not to lose any uh, new uh, activities. Thematic network is the nearness, and the following will be the national engagement events in all of your countries, online and in presence and in your national language. So that's all from our side. Uh, you have the links uh, you also have in the chat, the link to a feedback survey. We need to know how uh, we need to have your feedback for improving our uh, uh, implementation of activities. So it's crucial to have your uh, your feedback. It's just two minutes, three minutes. Minutes. So please answer our feedback. You have the link in the in the chat. And thank you so much to all of you to for your at, uh, attendance. And thanks a lot from the bottom of my heart to uh, the technical support we received from uh, Trusted uh, uh, that is partnered in in in. Um, in nations and they coordinate all these activities that we are doing real activities uh, uh, for uh, the engagement of, of uh, stakeholders in mission soil and Politecnico di Milano that are the uh, the um, uh, partner that uh, coordinate all of our thematics and um, uh, webinars uh, within uh, uh, nations. So that's all from uh, my side. Thank you so much. So I will see you in the following uh, nations events and we will see you in the project proposals uh, of nations and in the debates and new, uh, I hope, uh, new uh, projects from the, in the regional perspective for for uh, the soil uh, transformative um, challenges. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.